The legendary American jazz guitarist Stanley Jordan is about to do his first Australian tour. So we talked a little bit about that and about his music. So you're coming to Australia for the first time in August. I'm really looking forward to it, yes. So, okay, August the 4th in Adelaide, Melbourne, and Melbourne on the 5th and the 6th, and Sydney on the 7th of August. Mm -hmm. um, it's a solo a solo um, tour? Yes, that's right. And I've played in a lot of different formats, but solo is really my main thing. I think it's the core of what I do. And, and so I like the fact that for, for my first tour, I'm doing it as a solo tour. Yes. Um, I think it's a good opportunity for me to really kind of feel close to the audience and for people to kind of hear what's really the truly the kind of the soul of my music. Yes, you have something very special that you do. Um, you're going to see a new audience in, um, in Australia. So can you talk a little bit about this touch tapping technique of yours? Yeah, so piano was actually my first instrument. And I went through a period of a few years when I didn't have access to a piano. And that's when I started playing guitar. And I just absolutely loved it. I knew that guitar was my main instrument. But after a few years playing guitar, I started to miss some of the musical possibilities of the piano. And as I progressed in school, I had access to a piano again, and I started playing again at school. And I realized that I still really liked some of the things that the piano can do. But I like the expressiveness of the guitar. I feel like the guitar is such a personal instrument. I feel like when you're touching the string, your sound, um, you're, you're, it's just from your physical body to the string, there's more of a connection. And so I feel like the sound is more personal and I feel that the guitar is more expressive, but the piano allows you to do so many different things at once, the independence of the different lines and the fullness of the chords. So I started experimenting to try to figure out a way to bring some of that to the guitar. So it's definitely, I know some people have said it kind of resembles a piano. That was definitely in, intentional. And what I found and what, it's really exciting. And even after all these years, it's just, it just blows my mind, um, the doors that have opened musically, because you still have a lot of that expressiveness of the guitar and a lot of the textural possibilities of the piano, but they're brought together in a way that makes it almost like a new instrument. I mean, it's definitely guitar, but the musical possibilities are so different that it really is like musically like a, a different territory. Do you still do this routine where you go to a place and you sort of walk around your venue to to get a feeling of of how that is going to be for the night? Yes, absolutely. Um, to me, music is so much more than just the structure and the and the sound. I mean, we could talk about that. For example, I love talking about music theory and the structure of music and all that. It's great stuff. But there's an essence to music that goes beyond that, that you can't really explain. And what is so wonderful for me is being able to tap into that. I do find that it's a healing experience. Um, and I also find that it's, it's a sort of a growth experience. I know we use the word healing a lot, which kind of implies that there was maybe some prior state where we were healthy and we kind of somehow fell from grace and we're trying to get back to it, you know, but, but there's also, I think an element where music helps us to develop. Um, so to give you an example, um, man, I wish I had my guitar with me right now. Um, so for example, like in, in dynamics and music, so we've got these terms for different levels. So we've got the mezzo forte and then the next level up, from there is a forte but what's in between you know how many levels are there in between and especially the instrument that i play now my my vj arpege it's such an accurate instrument and so what i've found is that i can dial in these different levels and every level has a whole unique sound and personality and what happens is 
if I can tune myself in to, to really be able to get to these really subtle levels, I feel that it helps my audience also to become more, more sensitive. You know, in, in life, we're all bombarded with so much stimuli. We've got noise pollution. We've got electromagnetic fields in the environment. Um, you know, even just the temperature is going up. There's just so much stimuli all around us. And so I think it's, it's easy to lose touch with the, the quiet and the, the inner space. And, and so what I find, and especially with my solo show, is it's sort of a celebration of that. And hopefully if people have anything like the experience that I have when I'm, when I'm playing it, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's, it's actually sort of a way of experiencing your life more fully. I, I, I don't know how else to say it, you know, it's hard to put it into words, but there's definitely an element of growth involved. I guess as a solo, as a solo show, you won't need to be having a set list or of songs, will you? I sometimes have a set list, but not all the time. But you know, even when I have a set list, I don't always follow it because I really try to be sensitive to that moment and the environment when I'm playing. So for example, sometimes what I'll do is I'll start the concert without any thought of any particular song and I'll just start playing. And in that way, I do feel like the audience and the sort of the energy that they bring contributes to the direction of the music. And then it grows and it grows and sometimes that's it. It's a, it's a new composition. Other times I might realize, Hey, I know what song this is. And then I'll go into that song and I'll finish the, the song. But I love that idea that um, not only can the artist and the performer craft the music, but also the music itself is like a partner, like another conscious entity. At least it feels like that to me. And so I can listen to the music and the music tells me where it wants to go. Sometimes I feel like it's almost like, like somewhere deep in my mind or deep in the Akashic records or something. I don't know. There's a radio station there. And if I can find that right channel and dial in to that station, then all I have to do is listen and be faithful to what I'm hearing and just sort of translate it. And sometimes, what I'm hearing isn't even necessarily a sound per se, but it's more of sort of an energy or a flow or a gesture. And then it's my job as an artist and using my training as a musician to figure out how to translate that in, into notes, which makes it different every time. Yeah. So it's for, right. So for me, it's always fresh and also just sort of being on that creative edge which can be a little risky sometimes, you know, occasionally I play for a while and I just think this isn't very good and I lose confidence, you know, but, but most of the time I don't, most of the time I, I'm not even really conscious of it like that. If, if I start thinking about how well I'm doing, then immediately I, I fall from the heavy, you know, and it's just like a boom back to earth, you know, <laughs> and then I sort of, Oh, and I go back to the music and then it's just pure bliss again. <laughs> no, and it must be fresh all the time because, I mean, you're growing over the years, the way mm -hmm. you think the world will change all the time. So that radio is going to be changing really and talking back to you differently. From yeah, and it's different. Yeah. It's different everywhere. And I think, you know, there's stuff sort of rolling around in my mind. It might be stuff that I heard recently um, or it could be just... Um, my feeling or my state at the time. And I do, as I said before, I do think that, that the audience, the feeling of the audience plays a, an important role. You could go into the same venue um, the same evening and, and play for two different audiences and it's just completely different. Just the feeling is, is different. And I do feel like being sensitive to that makes for a better show. And also, really hearing the sound of the music in the room. You know, it's, it sounds so simple, but sometimes it's easier said than done because it takes so much concentration 
just to play the instrument accurately, especially when I'm using the touch technique. It's such an accurate technique. So I have to play those strings just right or I'll slip and I'll miss. And, and so, so on, one land, on one hand, it requires a, a really kind of a um, tight focus. Um, but on the other hand, um, if, if I get too caught up in that, in the particulars of it, then I'm going to lose the, the inspiration of it. So what my goal is, is to be really creative and really freely creative. But wh when the ideas come, whatever the idea is, I try to really play it faithfully. And, and, uh, and what I was saying, too, is when I'm really listening, to what I'm playing, which is a whole other skill in a sense, you know, um, then I think it's a lot better because then I'm able to let the music really guide me. You know, like I was saying, it takes so much just to play the music that, you know, how do you have any brain cells left to really, really hear what you're playing? The key to it, what I found is how I prepare. You were kind of asking about that, about how I pre prepare. and. What I find is, is that if I can get really relaxed and, and really dial it in to where it's with everything is done with the minimum of effort, then it becomes really easy. So the technique side of it becomes so efficient that um, I have more attention left to just think about where I want the music to go. So that's a lot of the key to, to what I teach my students. I do teach a lot and that's a real privilege to be able to do that and that's one of the main things I tell my students. Well you have an album of standards but they're not mm -hmm. standards as we all used to know standards they're not Hoagy Carmichael and you know Rogers and Hart but they're Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and the Beatles. Mm -hmm. and, and, and nowadays you know that's not such a big deal I mean then, I, you know, back then it was I mean there were a few precedents, I guess, already. For example, um, Wes Montgomery did some Beatles. There were things like that. And of course, John Coltrane did my favorite things. That was a more recent song. But but that was more rare. You know, for the most part, certainly in jazz, sort of the standard repertory was the Tin Pan Alley and the, the older songs. And I didn't really get the memo. You know, I just thought you just play songs. You just play popular songs and you jazz them up. That's why they call it jazz, you know. And and then when I moved to New York and I started going into the professional scene and I started getting out there and performing um, a lot more. And I found that there was pressure to do the older songs. And at that point, for me, there was no turning back. It's like why do I have to just do the older songs? Um, you know, the songs that I actually grew up with actually mean more to me. You know, I, I have memories of when that song came out and how people understood that that song. And I remember one, one night um, I had been kind of tossing and turning a little bit because it, it kind of was bothering me, kind of the flack that I was getting. And I remember woke, huh. I woke up and I felt just a little bit kind of angry and I was like, damn it, these, are, these aren't just some silly pop songs, you know, these are standards. These are my generation standards. So that's when I got the idea to do, to do the standards album and sort of celebrate the, yeah. the, the newer music. When you were young, you would have been a listener to other people's music more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you were playing when you were very young too, but I mean, mm -hmm. do you still, practice that now? I mean, do you listen, do you hear any pop music from 2000 onwards and think, oh, I could jazz that up too? Do you? Listen? Yeah, yeah, I do. And it's funny because sometimes Adele or I don't know. Yeah, well, in fact, um, okay, Adele. So in 2015, Kevin Eubanks and I released our duets album and we did a song by Adele um there's a song that we did this lights from ellie golding and that song was kind of more in the sort of edm pop vein and i remember i was on a long drive because i was on my way to meet kevin to to um start during the record and that song came on the radio and it was just so haunting and so beautiful and i said you know 
I bet you Kevin would like this song. And when I showed it to him, he said, man, let's do it. So we, we put that on, on the record. You know, the thing is, a good song can be interpreted differently. It can be reinterpreted. That's part of the way that you know that it's a good song is, is that it's not just an event that happened, but it's something that's been added to, to the culture and we can work with it, we can update it. So I, I think there's no, there's no end to it. Mm -hmm. I think that part of the key, and this is one of the things that makes it so interesting for me is, is that music has so many different elements and, di and different dimensions. So there's always something that you can find that's the, sort of the kernel, sort of the, 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 the seed or the heart of a song. And if you tap into that and really bring that out, then pretty much any song can you can find something new. You can you can find value, you know, um, and and even some of the songs that are already considered classics, you can find new ways to interpret them. For example, one of the songs I do a lot. I'm sure I'll be doing this on my tour is the slow movement from Mozart's Piano Concerto number 21. Yeah, I was listening to and, it today, yes. Yeah, you know, and, and there's one part in the melody where, um, okay, technically what it is, is it's the, um, the um, augmented second resolving upward to the major third. Well, when I hear that, that to me sounds like blues. And so I'll take those two notes and I'll expand on that and I'll play a blues lick from there, but, but only because Mozart gives me that. I, I wouldn't just throw it in. And so finding those moments when I can pull something out like that, and if Mozart were, were t around today, he'd probably be a killer blues player anyway, you know? And he improvised a lot. In fact, he improvised on that particular piece. And so taking the, the liberty, um, and finding those gems is part of the joy of, of what I do. Yes, you do it with Jimi Hendrix. Yes, yes. And I do have a show that I do called Stanley Plays Jimmy, which maybe someday I'll come back to Australia and I'll bring that show. But definitely that one needs, needs a band. But even when I do my regular solo show, I, I play some Hendrix material usually because he was my first guitarist that I emulated as a child. So he's kind of in my musical DNA in a way. But the Hendrix tribute show is a special thing unto itself because I imagine that I'm Jimi Hendrix. So I'm not Stanley playing, playing Jimmy's music, but I'm also playing Jimmy as an actor as well as a musician. And so it's a different kind of show. And what I do is I imagine what would Jimi Hendrix be doing today? So I try to portray Jimmy if he were still playing today and then try to play what I think he would be doing, which could be a genre unto itself because nobody really knows what he would be doing. So there's a lot of room to be creative, but there's you kind of have to have a feeling for his music and for his sounds because there's certain things that I wouldn't do because I just don't think he would be doing that today. It just didn't, doesn't feel right. You have to have a feeling for it. So anyway, that's, you know, sometime in the future, I'd like to, to bring that show as well. So on a solo tour, you could be pulling from all of that, from classical. I do, from yeah. Pop, pop from bebop for anything. I go from Mozart to Charlie Parker to Jimi Hendrix to Katy Perry. I just do all kinds of stuff, but I I try to weave it together. Too. Uh, what, what's mean, that? If you, if you survey your audience, I'm sure that mm -hmm. that's gonna affect what you might or might not play, depending on- it, 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 it does, yeah, it does have an effect. You know, a lot of musicians kind of have an attitude of, they don't want the audience to influence what they do because they feel like somehow it's selling out or it's cheating or, or whatever. You know, I don't really subscribe to that. Although I would say, um, okay, so there was a, a great pianist, jazz pianist from the San Francisco Bay Area. And I sort of grew up in, in his tutelage in a way because he had a 
weekly jam session. And I used to go for years. I went to Flip Nunez. I went to his jam session. And I remember one day um, somebody hollered out a request that he didn't feel like playing. And he said, all right, I heard what you want, but I'm going to give you what you need. And then he played a completely different song. Wow. But I, I, I love that because I think that um, you can be there for your audience. And, and part of what that means is giving them your very best. So that doesn't necessarily mean playing every request. You know, it's like somebody might request something, but that's not what I have in me right now. So I really shouldn't play that. I should play what I'm really feeling right now. But on the, on the other hand, um, the audience does affect what I'm doing because I want people to have a wonderful time. And so there's some give and take there. You know, I, I, I have an open mind. I have a, um, a big enough bag of tricks, so to speak. <laughs> so it's interesting for me to figure out, okay, what's going to make for the best experience tonight. And I actually kind of started that way of thinking in my in my days as a street musician, um, mostly in New York, because it wasn't a prepackaged audience. It was just whoever happened to be coming down Bleecker Street at the time or whatever. And so I was standing there with my guitar and part of the game that I would play is let me see if I can figure out something to play that's going to make those people stop and come over here and listen to what I'm doing. And, I, and it was actually during those days that I really discovered that I like a lot of different styles of music. And I started really seeing myself as a multi-style artist, even though jazz is my core and it's my favorite. But if you ask me what kind of music I play, it's just I play what I feel at, at, the, at the time. And I, I, I love that. I love having that openness. Yes. You talked about your guitar a, a little earlier. Arpez? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so VJ is the is the the the, the make of the guitar is, is VJ. That's to Patrice VJ, V I G I E R. Um, he's um, in Paris, so it's a French name. And that model is the arpege. And the arpege, this arp this VJ arpege has been my main guitar since something like 1988 or 89. And I just love the sound of this guitar so much. And so I feel so blessed. And that guitar and I have been around the world <laughs> quite a few times. We've played in about 70 countries together. And so I'm really, really thrilled to be adding Australia for the first time. It's been far too many years in coming. So I'm glad to finally be there with my VJ Arpege. <laughs> did he make it for you? Well, he did some customizations, but the wonderful thing about this guitar is he really didn't, didn't have to change much. One of the things with the touch technique is it requires a really accurate neck because I have to get the strings down really close the way I play, really close to the neck. And if you make them too close on a regular guitar then it doesn't sound good because they start rubbing and they start buzzing and so you have to have a guitar that's so accurate that that you can get the, that action down and uh i see that the phone is ringing i have another interview that i'm supposed to do now all oh, right i see so unfortunately i i have to, okay. to go, have to go. Um, okay thank you very much oh sure thank you so much and, and I, I really enjoyed talking with you okay all right, take care. Okay. Bye.